Allegheny Highlands Arts and Crafts Center. I'm here with Jill Jensen, who is the featured artist in the gallery this month. Her exhibit is called Natural Visions. It's a fiber exhibit, but Jill is a printmaker and she prints on fabric. And there are lots of other things as well. It's up through June 16th and you don't want to miss it. Jill? Yes. It's very wonderful to be here. I'm getting to see my show all hung and it looks fabulous. Thank you. I'm glad you like it. So Jill, let's start with these two. Um, it's a great blue heron, obviously, but I think it's so wonderful that you've been kind enough to bring us the print plate for it. So do you want to talk a little bit about the woodcut process and how, sure. it, how it goes? Yes, the great blue heron actually happens to be my favorite bird. And I have participated in Big Ink, which is a, a nonprofit that brings a giant printing press around the country. And so I was preparing for it by making a three foot by four foot woodcut printing plate. So this is cherry plywood because you need something that will be perfectly flat to run through an etching press. And then what you do is, or what I did, is I came up with a drawing and then I transferred the drawing to the piece of wood and then I took carving tools to carve away wherever I wanted, in my case, the fabric to show, and I left where I wanted the ink to go. So in designing this, I knew I wanted the heron as a centerpiece, but I was trying to figure out what to do around it. And I wanted to do something a little bit different for me, which is not to have a perfectly rectangular image. So I carved the uh, cattails to go up and bleed off the top and the side without having a rigid edge to it. So it took many, many hours of carving. And I because I'm not super tall, um, I had to have the wood on the floor and I was crawling around on the wood while I was carving so that I could get to the middle sections. So I left where I wanted the black ink to go and carved away where I wanted the fabric to go. So in this case, there was black oil-based printing ink was rolled over the whole surface of the plate and then you put the fabric or paper down on top, apply pressure, and the ink transfers to the fabric or paper. In this case, I generally work on fabric, so it was printed onto white fabric. And then to make the final piece, I like to stitch on it to give it texture. And so I use black thread and stitch in the black area so you don't really notice the stitching itself but it gives texture to the whole piece. These are really quite different from all the other pieces in the show and to me it's just sort of a what was she thinking <laughs> process <laughs> but they were stitched while you wore a blindfold? Yes so most of my work I have I won't say complete control, but as much control as I possibly can have over what I do. And I thought, sometimes maybe you just need to let go and just try something completely different. And so I decided that I was going to try stitching while wearing a blindfold. So I, <laughs> I know, <laughs> why would you want to do that? Um, and people go, well, why don't you have blood all over it? And the fact is that if you just sew very slowly, even though you can't see, you can kind of feel where you're going. So I threaded three uh, needles each time, put a knot in the end, and then I put my blindfold on, and then I picked up my fabric, and I always started on one end. So I made one design decision to begin with. And then I would just start stitching, a running stitch, and when I got to the end, it ended wherever the thread ended. And then I would reach around and find the next needle and start stitching again. So this was the first one that I did. And I assigned one color to each day of the week. And so I was very consistent that it, on a Monday, it was always black. On a Tuesday, it was always blue. So that I worked my way through the whole thing. And of course, because I have to have some control, <clears throat> I uh, did French knots across the bottom to record each day and that's how I know that this one is 71 days because there are 71 French knots across the bottom. And then my two favorite colors are red and turquoise so I went oh let's try red and turquoise. And so once again I threaded three needles each day and I alternated the colors each day and so just kind of went through. And it was fascinating to me how even though I was kind of sewing straight, it just becomes very random mm -hmm. when you don't see where you're going. 
and I would just, you know, pick up the next needle and I might start and the next thing I know it's kind of meandering to a side. So you can see all of the ends are sticking out um, wherever the thread ended. Eco printing is where you take actual leaves, place them on top of fabric, bind it together really hard, and put it into boiling or simmering water for like a couple of hours. And so there is no paint in an eco print. It's strictly the pigments from the leaf itself transferring to the fabric or paper. So this piece here is a combination of eco printing and relief printing. So there is no ink here whatsoever. This is strictly the pigment from a leaf and I had put an iron bath on it. So tannic acid from the leaf combines with the iron and makes okay. this black image. So all of these are strictly eco printed. The outline ones are relief prints, plates that I carved to print on. So this at the, and this yellowish color, the fabric was white, is a combination of tannic acid and iron mixing to get this kind of color. And then this part is the eco print. How long do you have to soak it to get? About 90 minutes to two hours. Really? Yeah. And it needs to be simmering. So it's a combination so it's of pressure, temperature, and water. OK. Because I've tried doing a little bit of it. It never comes out this nicely <laughs> for me. It just doesn't. Yes. So on this piece. This is cyanotype. OK. So with cyanotype, you can buy the chemicals, mix them yourselves, and paint them on the fabric, like I did with the piece called Currents. These are pieces that I actually purchased pre-coated fabric, so I don't have to do that because okay. when you're putting the chemicals onto fabric, you have to do it in the dark, it has to dry in the dark, and then you have to store it in the dark. dark. And so trying to do that in our house, I was carrying around wet fabrics dripping cyanotype chemicals on the floor, and I decided it was much easier to dry processed. So these, uh, the sheets that I buy are eight and a half by 11 pieces okay. of fabric that are coated. And these are actually a slightly different version. You notice that it's not just the bright blue and white, mm -hmm. because this is a, cyan a wet cyanotype. So instead of doing everything dry, I put water on it. And the way you do a cyanotype is you take your piece of fabric or paper that's coated, you put opaque objects on top. In this case, I'm using vines. So okay. leaves, and you can see the vine. Then I put a piece of glass on top to keep everything flat, and I put it out in the sun. And the UV part of the sun is what develops the chemical, the cyanotype okay. chemical. So then when you take it off, you have unexposed areas which stay light and exposed areas that turn blue. Traditionally, it's a dark Prussian blue. But if you toss water onto it during the process, the chemicals move around and you can get some really interesting colors happening and different speckles. Now, this is actually the back side of the fabric because I liked it better than the front side, <laughs> and it also okay. worked well with how I was laying out the image. This is two layers. One is an um, organza mm -hmm. that I dyed with indigo, and then it is put on top of a piece of green linen. Oh, okay. So you have the green linen showing through the dyed, indigo dyed organza, with then a wet cyanotype on top, which is then stitched with patterns of leaves in the open parts and going across and enhancing the shapes in the cyanotype. So the, the sort of varied fabric here is actually the result of what you did to dye the fabric yes. initially. Yes. So in that case... Do you ever get confused about what to do first? <laughs> Oh, occasionally. <laughs> well, and, and it depends on if I have the vision in my head beforehand, or sometimes I will be dyeing fabrics just to have, and then when I get an idea, then I go, oh, you already have this, let's try layering up these various things and see what happens. Jill, I think one of the other things that intrigues me is you seem to constantly gin up ideas of what to do that's very different from what you've been doing. And in these, you've used a cyanotype process, and you also have used an echo printing process. Mm -hmm. So if you'll talk about those two things a little bit in view of this particular short wall. <laughs> sure. Okay, this piece combines cyanotype with echo printing here, or I say eco printing, and then hand embroidery. So this was a found tea towel 
and then these were collaged on top. So I first had eco printed fabric and then had put some cyanotype chemicals on top and then oh, exposed it to the okay. sun and wherever the chemicals happen to be on the fabric is where it turned the dark blue and then where the chemicals weren't is where you still see the eco print underneath. And then when I started laying it out, it started looking like currents to me and islands. So yeah. when I was stitching it, I was making it going along with that concept of how would currents in the water be flowing around these sorts of things. And this piece actually made it to Australia, to a show in Australia of uh, people around the world who did um, stitching on tea towels. So the whole show was tea mm -hmm. towels by artists from around the world. Oh, so wonderful. that was kind of fun. Mm -hmm. I've never been to Australia, but this but piece has is. been. Yes. So you just need to follow it. Yeah, I need to follow it. And, and you've used a lot of found linens in, in this show. Yes, I, I decided I don't, I'm not even sure why, but all of a sudden I went, other people use found linens. I'm going to start trying it out and see how it goes. So this is a table runner. Um, obviously it's the linen sort of color. And these are all leaves that I collected. And this is not an eco print. This is a nature print. So for each of these leaves, it's the actual leaf that I inked the vein okay. side, flipped it down, rubbed the back to transfer the ink. So I just worked across the whole thing, just picking up different leaves that I had found, printed it, and then more hand stitching just to kind of all go in one direction across the piece. Now this one combines eco printing with a relief print. This was in my husband's rag bag that he was using to clean stuff, and I decided, oh, I think I need it. Um, and I like the fact that it already had some holes in it, so I eco printed it and then print, carved and printed this uh, acorn, rooted acorn, and then did stitching on it along the veins and also wanted a little bit of the green to show through because this is backed with green linen. Okay. And I wanted a little bit to show through and then the new growth to have a little bit of green on it. I really like that. I really like that effect. Just I'm going for the big, the big stuff. Okay. Right, because this, this plate is 60 inches tall and I am 61 inches tall. Um, so my husband frequently calls these prints that I do of people little Jills uh, because they're about my size and shape because when I do sh the shape of the body, I originally had him trace my body so I would have a shape to go by. So this is called Mother Earth and so the plate was 23 inches by 60 inches tall. Like the great blue heron, I transferred the image onto it and started carving. But what I did here was I only did a contour drawing, an outline drawing of the basic figure, but none of the patterning was in it. And so I was making decisions as I was carving what I wanted it to be. Like this flower shape is based on a fabric that my daughter brought back from Africa. And then I wanted to have, since this is Mother Earth, I wanted the earth in the womb sort of area. And then just from there, I started building up more patterns around the whole body. And I wanted to represent all of Earth. So she's standing on rocks, deeply rooted on rocks for Earth. Then we move into the ocean for water, and then we move on up to the sky for air so that you have the whole thing flowing through. And I wanted tree forms, vines for movement, the planet, and then, um, the the logo on the head kind of like seeing and nurturing. Like a lotus? Yes. Okay, Canicle of Creation I know is a long time passion of yours, both yes. the images and the whole concept. So tell me first of all just a, briefly about the Canicle and what the source is. The Canticle is a prayer written in 1225 by St. Francis of Assisi and it is in praise of all nature. And so I have broken the prayer down into seven parts. And I have done multiple versions of the canticle. This was the latest version. And it is all based on hands. And it's a combination of hands of my family. And so when my mother died, all of my siblings and I were with her when she passed. And I said, do you mind if I trace her hand? Because they're used to me tracing her hand. So they said, great. So they helped me trace her hand after she died. And so her hand is in the hand of God. And all of these hands are family members. So like, son is my husband. 
One of my sisters is water, another sister is Mother Earth. I'm Sister Star and Moon because I love the stars and moon. <laughs> <laughs> so you get, you're the artist. So you get I, to pick. I get to pick. Um, and then my brother is air, my brother-in-law is fire. And so I wanted to represent each of the parts of nature in these quilts and, and using family hands. So sometimes the hands are upright, but like for water, I wanted the circles to represent like water drops falling on a lake but also an homage to Hokusai's great waves, so you get the waves going. You have clouds with rain falling down, so different ways of representing water. For fire, uh, obviously the color. This is my brother-in-law's hand, and just flames all working around it. Next we have air, which is my brother. And um, it's, air is kind of tricky because how do you represent something that you can't see? You can feel it, you can hear it. So that's why all the hands are going horizontally. And so you see the motion of it with trees blowing over, with grasses blowing over. You know air because birds fly in the air, feathers fall through the air, leaves can fall through the air. And then here is Sister Death. Um, so that is my mother's hand in the hand of God. You usually see lilies around uh, mm -hmm. funerals and cemeteries, and then I have the cemetery here underneath. And then the final one is Mother Earth. So once again, I have the planet Earth. Uh, this is my sister's hand. I picked that sister because she likes to garden, so I thought that was appropriate. And then deeply rooted like a tree of life into the earth. That's just wonderful. I mean, I, I've read the canticle over the years, not only because of you, but again and again and again because of you. And I love that you've made those words so visible. Yes, yes. You know. Yeah, and these are all woodcuts also. So the plates were 22 by 28 inch pieces of plywood that I carved into to make the image. And then printed black ink on white fabric, then painted the fabric, and then stitched the text.